Good morning. So uh, I'll do a recap, players uh, recap of uh, our old school essentials uh, session 27 of Todd's Joff World. We are currently in an area in the world called Blackfish Bay. Um, Dell has a returning character, uh, Halfling Trotter. David's character, I believe, is a returning character, but uh, uh, I, I don't recall uh, if he's, he's, no, he had not met Trotter previously. So I think uh, Lauren, David's character, uh, and Trotter uh, meet in this session. My character's brand new, a cleric, uh, Jocko, who uh, worships a, a silent god in Joth's world, in Todd's world, Joth. A silent god refers to all the other gods that have been oppressed by the one true god um and so uh my my particular sect a religious sect would, would worship ultimately uh on the on the qt right so uh so my god is itis the god of hope um and uh my holy symbol is that of the rising sun and uh as they learned a little bit in session my character is unconcerned with the dead uh, uh we don't you know my god uh, of hope was only concerned with the living here and now uh, providing hope um and uh to those who are living blessing those that are living uh de dealing with the living world and of course uh uh so there you know again there's a, a moment in the beginning of the session where lauren expects my character to kind of consecrate the the, the graves of fallen heroes that have been dug up by something and uh they find out my character, there's no hope for them. They're dead. So once they're dead, there there's no hope for them. So, so I leave that to the other gods of the of the. So anyway, um, that's my character, Jocko, cleric, first level, uh, and of course we have a dwarf, uh, uh, Brom Brom uh, Bombrick, 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 I believe, uh, John's character, and I think Bombrick is new to this, to the campaign as well. So this is session twenty seven. It's been going on on and off for, uh, gosh, I want to say a couple of years, maybe maybe even further, maybe three years we've been uh, in and out of this campaign world. I've played in about 16 sessions in total uh, as I was gone for almost a, a year. Uh, I think David's played in the most sessions. Uh, Dell's like a, a close second. Uh, so it's pretty, it's, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. We've had a lot come and go too, right? Uh, Kevin, I think, has played in this. And of course, Justin and Mark Kernow has been in this, uh, this, this Joth uh, campaign world. So we've had a lot of guys fold in and out and they're obviously free to come in and out anytime they're available. So a great session. Um, uh, I really, of course, enjoy uh, Old School Essentials as it is the remastered, revised, uh, version of Dungeons and Dragons Moldvay edition, which is my, you know, sentimental favorite. It's my, it's my favorite uh, from my youth. It's the game I played through my youth. Uh, basic only. I didn't mess around with expert much. Um, so it's, it's a great game and it is, there's no doubt in my mind, Old School Essentials is the perfect remastering of the old Moldvay basic ex expert uh, sets. Uh, they just do such a great job of of, of keeping, they don't change anything, but they really tighten up the organization and clarify some things, but they don't edit the actual uh, rules, which is what makes it such a, uh, it makes it such a um, quality, it adheres to to what was Moldvay, which is very, you know, uh, appreciated by guys like me. Okay. Um, so it starts with Trotter uh, on his pony and my character, uh, walking out from it. So the, the, a little bit of background here is uh, my character and uh, one of my characters and one of David's characters along with Dell's uh, halfling Trotter. We came out here uh, weeks ago uh, in response to a local farmer who says there's a tree is uprooted and a doorway to an underground uh, 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 tomb or something has is has, has been has been exposed. And uh, he came to request help as his dog had gone into this this tomb. And so uh, we thought, well, we can fetch a dog from a tomb. Uh, you know, um, as, as it, as of course, you know, <laughs> it's never that easy. My character ends up dead. David characters end up, my character was destroyed by a giant dwarven ball trap. It rolls down, crushes my character. David's character 
it's not David. I'm sorry. This wasn't David. This was um, uh, John's character. I'm sorry. John's character uh, ends up dying in a, a floor collapse trap in a uh, tr in a, a tomb of uh, clearly these traps were there to protect the treasure of this fallen elven uh, lord. And Dell's character survives. The dog, unfortunately, breaks Dell's character's fall in the same trap and the dog dies there. Dell recovers the treasure. Uh, he uh, uh, he uh, buries us in the farmer's land, not far from this to this uh, dungeon. He buries the the dog. I, I I I'm not certain if he left the dog or where the dog's at, but uh, he did bury us. He took the treasure back. He purchased a local tavern with that uh, with that treasure. Uh, I think he did. No, wait a minute. That's another character that purchased that uh, tavern. Uh, Dell had another character that he ultimately purchased a tavern in town and retired that character, I think, is what happened there. So Trotter's like his replacement character for that guy. Or a return. Trotter may have been a return character. Again, I didn't meet Trotter in other sessions yet. So we all meet there at Farmer Ted's uh, in response to the boy, the young, the farmer's youngest uh, son, 13-year-old uh, Eric, Eric, uh, fetches us off in the town as his family at the, has been brutally murdered by something. As well as the graves of the two fallen heroes have been exhumed and uh, hacked to bits by this same, uh, the boy believes, the same um, uh, adversary, so to speak. So, um, uh, in the last session, which I wasn't uh, available for, um, the remnants of that last session was uh, a camp. And Trotter, the most important piece of that is Trotter was uh, fell victim to a sh something and collapsed unconscious. He fell victim to some shadow. And the shadow visited him in this unconscious fit and uh, warned him that he was coming for him, right? Kind of thing, right? And in Joth, you know, uh, uh, if it's death come a-calling, we all must have those dreams every night, right? Because, because characters are going to die. I mean, this is, this is, uh, old school, uh, gaming, right. Um, the, the weak need need not apply, um, you know, for, uh, the idea that your characters are going to grow powerful and live, uh, long and prosper, right. Is, uh, just, you're not playing the game, um, fairly probably if that's occurring, right. Until, until your characters begin to uh, survive, right. Okay. Okay. Um, so we all meet there. This We're all introduced, um, and we decide to head off into this uh, with Trotter leading the way as he's been here before. So we all kind of elect Trotter to lead the way as, as hey, man, you've been here, and you tell us you've cleared this thing out. There's nothing down there. Well, then you can lead the way. I take up the very back, as I describe to the party, that it's part of my responsibilities um, to, to my god, Idis, that my character never leads. My character always follows, uh, and it, from the back provides hope. Um, obviously, my character would be called upon by his god to take the lead uh, and provide hope if if the situation demands. And that does occur later in the session. My character has to lead the way with his holy symbol uh, in preparation for this undead creature or maybe having to push out the undead creature. So it was fun. We had some laughs. Uh, um uh, so Dell leads us back down the, the stairs, uh, in the stairs before we get to the, the what we think is the last floor of this dungeon headed north. Uh, we come in, we go west down the, or east, uh, no, west, uh, east, east down the stairs where it curves off into the darkness. And then again, we turn north down the stairs to a third level. Uh, and um, right at the top of those stairs as I'm last uh, out of the corner, I catch before I'm surprised by this shadowy thing. I, sp I spin around and I get Lauren's attention and I point it out. The creature uh, is a shadow that kind of reaches out from the wall and then re re recedes back into the wall and uh, further tracks down the uh, passage into the darkness. And Lauren and I tell the group and uh, they don't believe us, you know, okay. You know, they kind of don't believe us. Um, uh, Trotter uh, uh, um, speaks of the shadow to us and this dream that he had. And of course, uh, Lauren and I say, see, that's this may be the same thing. My character basically uh, accuses Trotter of unleashing this thing, or not accuses, but suggests that maybe this creature's here because of him or is here for him. And maybe we're going to be, we're kind of caught in the middle between you and the shadow problem you've got. We uh, continue to investigate. We find a, a one goblin dead at the foot of a chain hanging in a wall that, it, that the goblins have uh, uh, collapsed. Uh, the other goblin stands wounded and moaning. Uh, we hear this morning we enter the dungeon. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, Trotter, um, because we haven't been there before, uh, the rest of us, but Trotter would recognize that moaning. And is it assumed it's this moaning coming through these pipes? It is a, it is, it's a trick of sorts. However, as we descend the stairs and come into this room, we see the goblins and we know, we realize that the moaning is legit as it's coming from a goblin that has been wounded by this, this, uh, kind of a uh, force electrical electrified kind of uh, supernatural force field uh, that this chain that appears to be uh, in this in, in this heavy chain that blocks the, the passage further north. Uh, we discuss what our options are. Um, uh, Trotter gives us a little more information about what we're dealing with as far as the, what those locations are, etc. He mentions the ball trap. The dwarf then confirms, yes, as Jocko says, what ball trap. And the dwarf then uh, describes what a ball, a dwarven ball trap looks like and how big it is. And I said, wait a minute, can't, you know, so Jocko then suggests, why don't we use this giant ball to breach this chain force field? Because, uh, because, uh, uh, and we know that it might be breachable because uh, Bomberick picks up the dwarf, I mean, the uh, goblin uh, while it's wounded and, and, and surprise it kind of pitches it into this force field. Uh, it is zapped and killed, but it's too light to move the chain. Then we have this conversation and it uh, dawns on us we could use this giant boulder to push to force through this chain field and maybe the to our best guess sprint behind the ball as we push it through or run behind the ball as we push it through uh hoping to get through it behind this ball without being electrocuted uh i take up dead last again the boy in front of me uh lauren and then of course uh the dwarf and then below the dwarf in the very front uh, so basically, both the halfling and the dwarf are pushing simultaneously as they're, he's short enough to be right underneath him, Lauren behind, etc. Well, Lauren, unfortunately, uh, it, uh, suffers a little damage, gets fried a little bit. The boy gets fried a little bit. I, I, I managed to get through last, but we, for the most part, we all get a, through this thing unscathed as we, we pried this boulder out um, and we walked it down. We, I shouldn't say we, Jocko watched for the shadow this undead. Oh, I forgot to say, when we came down, the shadow attempted to attack us. Well, it did attack us. We failed initiative. It got the first shot. And then uh, going first uh, on my turn of initiative, uh, as magic is, is generally, magic and missile generally goes before anything else, I, I stepped in front and turned it. Uh, fortunately, I rolled a nine and the creature ran away. Then we discussed what to do. We go up the stairs. Uh, my character leading the way now with my holy symbol and the torch. Uh, in case I, I mean my holy symbol and uh, the, the torch in case I have to again turn this thing away or other creatures that might be similar to it. We secure the boulder, we move the boulder, we step it down the stairs with with strength checks. Todd did a great job of of utilizing our, our, our attributes for these tests, which was brilliant. We get down, then we then push the ball, we organize and push the ball toward them. And again, Todd comes up with a great uh, so this is the great thing about old school, right? We can come up with uh, mechanics that allow the game to function without it being, um, right? You don't have to. I mean, he could have said you certainly can pass through this barrier and you're just going to suffer one point, one to four points of damage. I mean, he, but he allowed us to make dexterity checks modified by how far we were from the front of the ball. So my character had the worst modifier to get through it unscathed. Uh, again, um, the only two to get hurt was David. David unfortunately felt his dex check, and the boy uh, felt his dex check. Um, well, we get through it. Um, uh, again, David and the boy uh, injured a little bit there by uh, fried by this electrical, supernatural, magical force <clears throat> pushing the ball away. We then come out. We see we see a, a, a hallway, or I should say, really more technically accurate. The dwarf with his uh, ability to see uh in the you know in the in, in poorly lit or, or dark situations the dwarfs can see 60 feet ahead and he kind of leads or leads us um we come to like a i would say a crossroads but i guess it is with a pillar and the dwarf spies on the on all four corners of this cross uh this large this i'll say large but a, 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 probably a 40 by 40 chamber with a pillar in the middle um, and of course, Trotter points out that, hey, this this kind of pillar is in the room where the floor, floor collapse, be aware of traps here. This this floor could be trapped. The dwarf sees these um, wall uh, carvings or uh, dwarven wall carvings or impressions. He can read dwarvish language uh, earlier. By the way, he had spoke to the dwarf. Uh, I mean, the, the goblins in Goblin um, and uh, learned that this thing had touched this 
this fence. Sorry, I'm really tired. I was up late and uh, got up very early this morning to get some stuff done. So I'm a little tired. I'm a little scattered, but hang, hang in there, right? I know that, uh, but okay. So he spies these murals. Um, I don't I don't know if they were reliefs or if they were painted. I, I, don't, I, I don't recall it, how Todd described them, but he did describe them. Uh, and the dwarf then um, ties himself. He, he, he gets out his iron spikes, his rope. He, he uh, uh, goes down the hall away from this area, spikes it in, ties the rope to it, gives the slack to all of us. And he crosses this floor uh, to the pillar first, hoping that if the floor goes, he would be rescued by this, by this rope. He then hammers in a spike and loops the rope around that to give him yet another uh, another device to catch him if he falls. It's like climbing a mountain, uh, setting uh, pitons, except he's setting the pitons, uh, you know, in the wall and in the post as he goes across, right? So it, he would, you know, drop and hang, hopefully, if the floor goes. So he gets over and he looks at this mural and he reads the Dwarven runes and it and it's, it speaks of the Dwarven city that for decades has been, a, a, has been burning, uh, apparently a victim of something, right? Burning and uh, I believe abandoned for the most part, as, as far as we know, I don't know. Um, but it was, but, but he recognizes that it's the, the great old Dwarven city kingdom. And it turns out that all these other three murals are of that mountain, that chain of mountains and the towers on the other side of that, that represent Dwarven, uh, spy towers or watchtowers or something, right? Uh, uh, but before we got here, see, I, again, I'm tired, so I'm a little out. I'm a little out of sequence. Before we got here, we came to these two alcoves where we saw what we thought were gold, um, gilded um, wolves or hounds or hyenas or something. Some kind of some kind of uh, gilded hellhound with ruby eyes. And of course, Trotter immediately with his knife is going to try to dig these out. Uh, Lauren is like, "Oh my God, man, we're rich!" And these things turn out to come to life. They step into the passage and they begin a melee with it as uh, Jocko and the boy run back up the hall behind the big ball. And we're trying to push the ball and I'm yelling, uh, you know, get out of the way. So I'm thinking we can push this ball because, uh, you know, Jocko at this point believes that they are actually mechanized dwarven. Uh, you know, I'm thinking they're slow mechanized golem, uh, you know, like 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 dog uh, golem type character uh, creatures, you know, dwarven make. And so we're going to push this ball and it'll roll down there. And I'm thinking we well, can push it and it'll roll down the hall and crush these things. Well, um, meanwhile, uh, 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 I believe uh, uh, Trotter and Bomrick recognize that it, they're not, it's they're painted gold. They're actually some type of, of, of creature, not actual metal plated. They're like wicker with a wire, with some kind of uh, wicker wrapping clay, and they're painted, they're gilded, but their eyes are indeed ruby, but they're still some kind of at, uh, automatons to some degree, right? Some kind of spiritual vessel, maybe, or I don't know. But they manage to, in uh, David and uh, Bomrick in two, in one turn, waylay this thing. Uh, 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 bom Bomrick is the first one to crush one of these wolf-type creatures, shattering a clay pot inside its... Uh, its... Uh, its... Uh, uh, you know, chest and it uh, spills oil all over the floor. Um, uh, and uh, they all warn off Lauren, don't use, don't use the torch, you know, don't light this a fire. And then uh, Lauren with his sword uh, cuts the other one down. And fortunately we, we kill those too sweet or we don't, they do. I, we did push the ball, uh, getting it started as I was yelling, get out of the way. But the ball, unfortunately I miss, we missed it to hit roll and the ball basically just, it rolls into the wall and stops. So we got the ball moving, the boy and I, but we missed it to hit roll. So the ball just kind of rolled into the wall, right? As, as Todd described it, it's like bounce, it like hit the wall and stuck there. They the way lay these wolves. We cut the rubies out. There are four of them uh, worth roughly, according to Bomrick, about 500 uh, gold each. Uh, all of us get one of these rubies, uh, except the boy, of course, uh, you know, uh, the, <laughs> you know, he's not a hero. He's an NPC, right? You know I mean? Anyway. So we go on down to the four corners. Again, we find this pillar. Uh, the, the dwarf analyzes these murals. He deciphers at least what he can out of them. And uh, from the uh, west passage, uh, as he's looking down that passage to see these doors, from those doors, uh, a dwarf with a giant battle axe busts out. And he says, you will you will die. Uh, for uh, Ultimately, uh, something you will all perish uh, for what you have done here the sacrilege of the tomb or some some 
cryptic thing that I can't recall, quote unquote, right now. But and that's where Todd drew the curtain. And it was an hour and 55 minutes, hour and 56 minute session. Fantastic. Um, OSC and Joth is, you know, Todd really should publish this uh, uh, campaign world. Uh, his his art, you know, Todd is one of the artists that we have uh, we have uh, employed to make art for our book and uh, maps for our book. And uh, we really appreciate his style and his art. And it's just remarkable to me. Um, there, um, and the art that he's using for our maps in Drive uh, Roll 20 is unbelievable. Um, I just love it. It's um, and I, I really believe he should publish this campaign book. I mean, ag make it system agnostic, um, and publish this sucker, man. I mean, I, I'm, a, it's, it's. I mean, we've been playing it. I think on and off for three years. I think he's been using it, uh, for years with his uh, locals. Maybe I don't know, but uh, th there is no doubt he should type this sucker up, get this art put together, and put it in a. The great thing about the world we live in now with the PDF uh, uh, print on demand, uh, PDF availability of drive through RPG. Um, I mean, he could, he, it would just take him time to get it all put together in a, you know, a codify it in a, in a, a book. And then he could have his maps and I mean, it would be great. And, you know, I'm a firm believer. I don't think everything has to be, um, I don't think everything that we publish has to be overly, um, how do I say this technical or overly, I think it'd be very cool to see GMs with their worlds and their hand-drawn maps and their hand-drawn notes. And their you have to type up stuff so people can read legibly what you've done because you couldn't read my handwriting. I'm, I literally have the, the worst scrawl any human being, uh, you know, possibly could. So you cannot read my handwriting. So you have, I have to, but you know, these can be scanned in and put into a PDF booklet. And wouldn't it be cool to be able to buy a PDF booklet of these hand-drawn maps and you just get them scanned into a, into a PDF scanned file. You can sell scans on drive through RPG and put it all together in a simple little, and, it, and, and to get somebody like, I'm thinking like Runehammer. I mean, Runehammer, um, Hank uh, used to, you know, have his videos. I think he still has his videos up where he would show his actual DM, his actual DMs notebooks because he's a brilliant artist. And I'm thinking, man, people, you could get those suckers scanned. People would buy those notebooks and use them for their campaigns, you know, instead of instead of these, you know, overly, uh, overly perfect, um, boring, you know, aerial font. Now, you know, my stuff, pretty boring, right? So anyway, I think that would be so cool. So you could almost do it with just, you know, a, a few pages of typed uh, references and a little bit of lore, a touch on lore, because, you know, uh, just in what he's written in our uh, Discord channel for the gods and the lore and what we've already played, it's phenomenal. I would suggest Todd publish this, to be honest with you. I think it's brilliant. Um, it is, uh, and of course, Todd knows it well, and he, and he DMs it perfectly. Um, and uh, great fun, old school, uh, an old school romp, right? Um, um the guys are great. Uh, Dell's character is coming along as he's uh, he's well into this character. I think he's had, I don't know how many sessions with Trotter, which is great. Uh, David, I, I do believe this Lauren character is not a new character for David. Uh, maybe he is. Maybe this is a brand new character. I, I missed that somehow. I, I don't know if I'm, maybe David played a session I missed. Uh, I think I missed two sessions, unfortunately. Um, my character, of course, brand new. And uh, it's been a couple of sessions since. And I think, again, uh, John... But these are these are great. And what's great about it is we're adhering to the rules. But of course, the joy of the old school uh, games, the joy of the or playing old games, uh, whether you're playing OSE a remaster uh, as an old school OSR of Moldvay or you are you playing actual Moldvay, the flexibility um, is phenomenal. Right. And this is what makes these games so great. And it's what makes GMs stick to them for 40 years as they as they customize them and they sculpt them and they're they're flexible. You can do these things without breaking them, right? Now I've talked a lot over the last five, six or seven years about rules as written. Um, and I've written I've played a lot of games, rules as written purposely in the last five or six years, because I had never done that, right? I had been I had been the homebrew guy. I'd been the guy that never did everything that I read in the book. 
And then I went through a period where I said, it's so important that I experience these games the way they were meant to be, uh, way they're written, whether they're meant to be or not by Gary Gaius would even say himself, ah, you know, it's just a book. I get that. But I wanted to experience them as if you dug this out of a time capsule 300 years from now and somebody read it and did not know anything about Gary Gygax, et cetera. Let's play the game the way it's written in the book and just discover what, what it would feel like. So I've played a, almost every, all, in all the new games uh, systems that I've played in the last five or six years. My goal was to read them and then play them as written, get familiar enough with them that I knew what I, I could change that wouldn't break the game, or I knew that I could change something I just didn't like or I didn't uh, prepare. All of us old guys, who have played versions of D&D &D, from AD&D &D to basic D&D &D to D&D &D 2 to advanced D&D &D to D&D &D 3, we know pretty much uh, in the D20 OSR uh, old D&D &D formulas what we can change. I mean, we're, we've all been around long enough to know that we don't like experience points for, you know, so you take out experience points or we know that we don't like using group initiative or whatever. So this is, you know, experienced players and GMs, they don't need to play Moldve, you know, at 50 years old, if they've been playing Moldve properly, they don't necessarily need to adhere to those things. I had never played Moldve properly and so adhered to it uh, uh, later. And again, um, partially just to experience it, you know, what if, what, what if, what if we played this thing pretty strict, right? Which is fine, right? But the point is, this is what this is what these games do for us, right? They give us these guides, they give us these boundaries, they give us the rules we need to, 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 uh, you know, uh, to infiltrate the, the the world, the imagination. But then we have this flexibility to make sense of these situations that the players will create. We're going to move this giant ball down the stairs, and we're going to use it to breach this thing. And Todd's going, well, there, you know, okay, what's the rule like for that? And uh, how are we going to do this? And and uh, that's the great thing about these games. It allows the GM to adjudicate something. Uh, and I believe most GMs will adjudicate it in a fair way, right? Generally, um, again, you're risking your life to follow a giant ball through a magical barrier or some kind of some kind of supernatural electrified barrier. We don't quite understand it uh, as characters or we don't need to as players. Um, so uh, what's the best way to do that without just saying make a save versus death, right? Or, but he could have, you know, he could have said, yes, you pass through it, guys, following the ball. The ball is strong enough to breach the chain. However, the force field, uh, it, it, the force field's it, it, not impacted by this ball. And you're all going to have to make a save versus, you know, uh, dragon's breath uh, and, to, and suffer half damage. Right. Um, uh, and that that would have been fair. Right. I th we would have all accepted that this is some power greater than this, you know, but it worked. And the way it, it, it worked because it became somewhat dependent on our attributes. And, and dependent on how we aligned ourselves, easier for the guy in the very front, uh, harder for the guy in the very back. And it, it, it was so it was fair and it was great. And we could then visualize, you know, this this mechanical choice that we as we aligned ourselves to push this ball. Uh, it also makes logical sense um, mechanically as to as to how we are proceeding, how we're using this tool to breach this chain to get through this this wall. Now, the chain itself may have been what was creating that barrier. So once the chain was breached, right, and we're pushing it through, the chain starts to fall back. That's where that's where Lauren gets caught in it and the boy gets caught in it and I just happen to dodge through it. I could visually see exactly why Todd did the adjudicated mechanical choice he did. And that's what makes these old school games and really all, you know, you could do this with D&D 5e, by the way. I mean, it's you know, not, as, not as if you can't do this with Pathfinder or something. It's just the people who play those games might not be so open you know, Pathfinder players might not be so open to the GM um, adjudicating something that isn't in the Pathfinder books. I mean, there, there tends to be a certain mentality that chooses D&D 3.5 or D&D, you know, Pathfinder. Um, you know, they're less less inclined to let the GM wiggle room in these situations, I think. Uh, that seems to be my experience with those players and my experience at those tables. So... Anyway, great game. Wonderful session with the guys. I, I missed it, man. I've been gone. I've been under the weather and uh, uh, holidays. So it's great. Um, Todd, brilliant job, guys. Thank you. And again, um, if you have not played OSE, um, it's 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 well it's well worth the look-see. Um, the books are available in PDF, I think, still. Um, I only own the one. 
I don't own the the hardback, beautiful uh, series of black books, which they they put them all together. I wish I had bought it when it was available, um, but I did not. Um, anyway, uh, I might even be able to convince my locals instead of White Box to be playing that. But uh, uh, we 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 appreciate White Box for its uh, certain simplicities, further sim simplifying certain things for us. So and like like the one save that can be anything. It could be a save versus falling down, a save versus you know uh electrified chains right it could be you know anyway it was outstanding and i'm sorry my recap was a bit discombobulated but i'm a little I'm a little fatigued and i'm going totally off memory here at i think it's six in the morning now but i got up at 3 30 to do some chores and to get a workout and everything so it's um it is what it is but uh thank you and uh, everybody have a wonderful wonderful uh weekend bye